A new RPG, in-depth character customization, deep narratives, choices matter, unique personal stories, rich interactive worlds. Does this all sound familiar? These descriptors, along with various other elements of a good role-playing game, are tossed around like cheap candy at a parade when studios aim to tag and define their game's experience. Most are happy to have a leveling system, a handful of skills, and proceed to slap the RPG tag on the box because it looks good and appeals to a wide range of audiences. Sadly though, most fail to deliver a true, fleshed-out role-playing experience despite their claims. But every now and then, you get a studio whose roots are so deeply entrenched in the genre that the aforementioned components and elements are not only fully present in their game, they're practically oozing from every crack and crevice in the world they've constructed. This is the Consummate Shill. Join me for an in-depth look into the good, the bad, and everything in between in the Outer Worlds. The Outer Worlds was developed by Obsidian Entertainment and published by Private Division. Obsidian is responsible for some titles you may have heard of. Fallout New Vegas, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic 2, and Pillars of Eternity just to name a few. The studio really needs no introduction and they're the reason for all the hype surrounding this game. Now normally I don't spend too much time, or any time at all for that matter, talking about a game's publisher, but Private Division is a unique one. They're a subsidiary of Take-Two Interactive. Take-Two publishes gigantic blockbusters, mostly from Rockstar and 2K Games, but they created the Private Division to focus more on smaller studios they believe in, like Obsidian, to provide them with the support they need to develop a game like The Outer Worlds. Because don't forget before we move into the review here, Obsidian had roughly 70 to 80 people working on this game, and that's a drop in the bucket compared to a lot of what we call AAA titles today, which can have teams of, you know, three, four, five hundred developers, sometimes upwards of a thousand working on a single game. They've really accomplished a lot here with their small team. Having discussed this partnership, however, Obsidian was acquired by Microsoft near the end of 2018 and is now a part of Xbox Game Studios. The Outer Worlds story takes place in a futuristic space setting where mega corporations have taken over and started terraforming and colonizing alien planets. You were cryogenically frozen along with many thousands of others on a colony ship and were supposed to be taken out of hibernation after a 10 year journey to another planet. Seven decades later, you wake up, having just been thawed out by an eccentric mad scientist type, and he starts bombarding you with all manner of bad news and insanity on what the galaxy has become since you started your voyage three quarters of a century ago. Now it's up to you to take down these corporations and make things right for the future of the colonies. Or, really, do whatever the hell you want, when you want, on your own terms. Obsidian puts you in the driver's seat of their rich first-person action RPG and invites you to mash the pedal to the floor and take whatever twists, turns, scenic routes, or shortcuts you see fit. And believe me, if you're a fan of this genre, you're going to want to drive it till the wheels fall off. Now before we move on, if you're new to the channel, I'm here to bring you honest and in-depth reviews of games to assist you in deciding where to spend your hard-earned money in the gaming world. I've actually spent significant time playing these games, and I do this because in this wasteland of watered-down, lifeless crap reviews, real fans of gaming deserve an unbiased and honest voice. So sit back, relax, and enjoy yourselves as we explore why there's so much buzz surrounding a game from a smaller studio, and whether Obsidian can still deliver and live up to the immense hype surrounding it. Creating a unique character is maybe the most important feature in games like these, and over time, you're free to mold yourself into whoever you want to be. Any RPG worth its salt is going to have a vast amount of statistics and character customization, and you're going to make some decisions about who you are right from the start. You'll have six attribute points to allocate and more broad categories that affect a wide range of statistics. They allow you to subtract from these for extra points to put elsewhere, but you'll go below average in that particular attribute and suffer a penalty for it. This is a great feature as it allows freedom of choice and the ability to create a really unique character. Afterwards, you'll have two skill points to load into some more specific categories. These skills will be leveled to 50, and after that point you'll have to improve each skill individually. This system sort of allows you to be more well-rounded early on and then specialize once you've figured out what type of character you'll become. You'll also select an aptitude at this point, which is basically the job you held before going into hibernation. It's rather insignificant, really, and only offers a small bonus. It's just one of those little added sprinkles of flavor and detail Obsidian is known for. 
Now, your appearance. I didn't really spend too much time on this because, honestly, in a first-person single-player RPG, I don't see much point stressing over your looks, but you can go nuts with it if you want. You're able to make some rather revolting-looking gargoyles with this editor, which was pretty entertaining. I won't get too far into what all the statistics do, because that could be a video in itself, but you can couple the stats into two main categories. Combat or skill checks. The melee and ranged weapon skills are pretty basic and improve the crit chance and weapon sway per point invested. Medical will improve the amount healed by the inhaler, sneak reduces NPC awareness and increases sneak attack damage, and so on down the line. Each point in a skill will give you a minor bonus to the corresponding mechanics. The big bonuses for each stat, however, are the 20 point milestones. You'll earn a large bonus related to that particular skill when you hit the levels 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. These are sort of a mixed bag and range from not so useful all the way to godlike. When you're allocating skill points, aside from increasing the number for higher dialogue checks, these bonuses are chiefly what you're going to be working towards. After you're out in the world, you're going to get 10 skill points per level and one perk point every other level, starting at 2. The perk points offer pretty significant bonuses to a variety of game mechanics. The perks range from things like increased run speed or carrying capacity all the way to reduced companion ability cooldown or increased science weapon damage. You get plenty of options here, and again, you're going to have to take a stance on some of these and make some decisions because there's 42 total. Before we move on to NPCs and dialogue, I need to mention the game itself is an open world in the massive open sense we're used to today. It's not linear by any means, but instead you're going to be traveling to and exploring different areas of planets on the nav terminal. Some of the areas are very large and have a nice wide open feel to them, while others feel slightly claustrophobic, and it'll leave you wanting a little more room to stretch your legs, I think. All in all, I enjoyed the world design, even if some of the areas did feel a little cramped sometimes. Could it have been larger? Yes, but oftentimes I feel like we fall into the habit of always thinking bigger is going to be better, and I... I really don't know what I'm getting at with that, but I, suffice it to say, the size and style of the world design is fine, and I think it works really well for the game. I'll discuss how everything looks and what I think about that later on, but I just wanted to touch on the structural design here before going any further. Now the big draw, the big shabam in this game for me, was the narrative and the personalities you encounter throughout the colony. The path I chose took me down a road with a narrative that was meaningful, and it really works to make you feel as if you have a huge stake in the future of the colony. You're faced with decisions that constantly evoke emotions all across the spectrum. It was a roller coaster of ups and downs, and as far as feelings toward the different settlements went, you know, from these people are pieces of shit, I'm going to massacre this whole town right now. And it went all the way to, good god, this community is being crapped on, I need to get involved and do something about it. And when you do take action, in either case, your choices ripple outward across the game world, altering most future interactions you'll engage in. The dialogue and response choices are vast and actually make sense in the context of the conversations. The writing is top-notch, and most of the voice acting is right there alongside it in terms of quality. There's a good amount of humor spread throughout the game as well, and a good bit of it being tongue-in-cheek, but all of it, really, it's great. One feature I absolutely loved was having sort of sidebar conversations with my companions about mission details and the unknown potential consequences of making one decision versus another, things like that. Just really, really good stuff there. It makes you feel like you're actually talking out possibilities and making important decisions together as a crew instead of just blindly making every choice off the cuff, your way or the highway style, which you absolutely can do, but the companion consulting is a great feature and it works well. The characters actually have personality, and each one you speak to feels different conversationally, and they look unique too. They weren't just a bunch of recycled faces to talk to like you see these days. Each character is unique, and you always feel like you're actually meeting new people. And my good lord, you meet some real freaks out in this world too. Some real characters. There's one in particular I can't seem to get out of my head. She looks like the twin sister of Matt Damon's Lenny the Pep Disguise from Ocean's 13 if you've ever seen that movie. <laughs> Holy shit, what a creature. The lip syncing is also pretty good. It's, it's not perfect by any means, but it's a hell of a lot better than some of the talking heads we've seen in games recently. You can certainly look the characters in the eye and not be deterred by the kung fu movie syndrome we get sometimes, which I think that's an overlooked feature, and it's a very important one in a game with so much dialogue. I know it's a lot to ask, but I must have your help securing more if we're to save the rest of your fellow colonists. I'd see it done myself, of course, but the board has a sizable bounty on my head. Obsidian really presents likable and hateable characters, but most of all, believable and high-quality characters from start to finish. Maybe none more so than your autonomous digital astrogator, or Ada, which is your ship's onboard AI system. She really is a fantastic character, and you'll interact with her frequently. Huh? Oh, 
I am alert and awake. Not to worry. I take our ship's security highly seriously. Just something to add before moving on to combat, all of the dialogue, statistics, and to a lesser extent the text stats will be checked against in some form or another in the majority of conversations. Leveling up these skills allows you to interact in a much wider scope, and it, it affords you more opportunities to take a particular conversation into that, you know, more exact direction that you may have been hoping to. You're definitely rewarded for investment in these skills. Now there is a disclaimer for this, it seems like you can skill check away pretty significant pieces of content. Now I'll be careful here to avoid spoilers, but one example of this is a friend of mine and I by random chance turned out the same ending sequence. However, my ending resulted in a pretty epic fight where, on the other hand, he was able to talk himself out of having this battle altogether. When we talked about it, we were both pretty surprised you could bypass a piece of content like this entirely, but truthfully, I guess you could consider this a plus and just chalk it up to you do really blaze your own trail and make choices that are genuinely your own. If you want to go the route of the diplomat, smooth talker type and talk your way into or out of any situation, you do have the option, and, and that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Now, combat. I usually do this section right up front and kick the review off with it, but in a game like The Outer Worlds, it's more of a supporting role than the star of the show. Be that as it may, I can tell you without pause that the combat in this game, in my opinion, is at the top end of what you're going to find in these deep, deep story and dialogue rich RPGs. Truth be told, I, I wasn't expecting much here, but the gunplay is actually pretty damn good and your weapon choices are diverse enough to keep you interested. I thought the combat was going to be sort of an afterthought like it is in so many of these titles, but you do get a solid experience here. There are plenty of weapons to choose from and several mods to be found to upgrade and alter them to your liking. Now I would have liked to have seen more weapon mods overall because the selection is pretty thin, but the small amount of available mods are at least impactful enough that they feel necessary and rewarding to use. One big element of the modding system is you can change the damage on most any type of weapon through modifications. The four damage types are physical, shock, plasma, and corrosive damage. Now, as an example, say you're running into auto mechanicals a ton in a certain area. Those enemies are weak to shock damage, but you don't have an appropriate level weapon that deals shock damage. You can go to a workbench, and if you have a shock magazine mod, you can simply apply it to one of your current weapons, and it transforms that weapon ammunition to shock rounds, and voila, now you have a better weapon for the situation you found yourself in. And just to note, one thing I did notice here is there isn't a physical damage mod, so if you want to alter, say, a plasma weapon to deal physical damage, you'll have to apply a magazine capacity mod, for instance, to remove the plasma mod and make the weapon physical again. I may be mistaken, but I don't recall a way to just remove a mod that's already been applied. I was just overwriting them with new mods if I wanted to change something. Now there are some pretty interesting, what are called science weapons in the game that do some pretty funky stuff. Just to name a couple, there's the Mind Control Ray, the Shrink Ray, and they do pretty much exactly what the name would suggest, but my personal favorite is the Gloop Gun. You can give any of these weapons to your companions to use as well, which is really useful, especially for the Gloop Gun. It turns any companion into sort of a crowd control machine, as this thing slows enemies down and sort of throws them into an anti-gravity state. It's a really cool gun. And companions, so you're going to come upon several characters that are interested in joining your crew. They'll fight alongside you through the game as well as chime in on dialogue sequences as I mentioned earlier. They can be really useful in most combat situations, but I, I gotta say, probably the biggest psychotic f***ing annoyance I had in this game was when a companion would run in front of you while you're aiming down sights engaged with enemies. I could see this happening every now and then and it not being a big deal, but it was a commonly recurring issue and it was just, it's ridiculous. On the topic of annoyances and companions, they also have special abilities you can activate that perform stronger attacks. Upon activation, however, it throws you into a cutscene, the same cutscene every single time you use the ability. Now this could definitely be forgiven if you could turn this feature off, but for the life of me, I, I couldn't find a way to do it, and it resulted in just never using these abilities during my playthrough because of it. Losing control of your character in the middle of combat for any reason really other than being stunned or something like that is, is high on my list of things not to do in a game. The only other instance of this mini cutscene stuff during combat is when you do sneak attacks that result in a one-shot kill. Sneak attacks, by the way, once you get sneaked to a certain level, when you open up from a sneaking position, you do increase damage, whether it be melee or firearms. For instance, if you snipe something without aggro and you kill them, it'll play a short one-second cutscene of that NPC hitting the dirt. I thought I'd be put off by this, but planting a bullet in the back of a marauder's head and watching them give face down into the concrete, it, it never really got old for me. One thing I will say about these execution type shots though, 
if there are other enemies around the NPC you kill, most of the time if you just take one shot, they'll become alerted, but they won't attack you. I don't know, it's just strange. Uh, an enemy sees his partner get vaporized by a plasma slug to the dome and reduced to a pile of ash right in front of him and he just goes about his business. He just continues to patrol like nothing happened. You know, maybe this is nitpicking, I don't know, I, I think it should be looked at. Now a big part of the combat we have to discuss is the Tactical Time Dilation System, or TTD. The system is similar in concept to the VATS, or Vault Tech Assisted Targeting System from the Fallout series. Fallout's VATS system was more involved, I think. Uh, it gave you deeper options, and multi-shot, multi-targeting, etc. And it was a really innovative and fun mechanic. Where that system fell short for me, though, is in VATS, you don't actually take the shots. It's all automated. You make your selections, and then it's up to RNG as the shots are taken without your control. In the Outer Worlds, however, you activate TTD and it slows down the world around you almost to a halt and allows you to examine your enemies and take shots that can blind, knock down, cripple, maim, various other effects as well. But, but the point here is you actually pull the trigger and take the shot in real time versus watching the cutscene like you do in Vets. I do like the TTD system better out of the two for that reason, but I would have liked to see bonus damage for shooting specific body parts as well as reduced damage for shooting tougher and more armored body parts of enemies. As far as combat goes, there's not much more to say. Gear and equipment wise, you only have two armor slots, chest and helmet. Uh, that should have been expanded on quite a bit, I think. That was a miss for me and really a wasted opportunity to add another layer of gear options and customization. Also, out of the two, the chest is the only piece that can be modded as far as I understand. They're just... there should have been more gear options in the game when it comes to armor. One thing I'll add, I mentioned the workbench earlier. You'll have to break down weapons and equipment for parts in order to repair your equipment, which will degrade pretty rapidly with heavy use. The more your weapons degrade, the less effective they'll be, so repairing them is important. You can also tinker at the workbench, in which you just spend bits to increase the damage on weapons or the armor value on your armor. So, moving on, there are four difficulty options in the game. Story, Normal, Hard, and Supernova. Supernova adds various challenges, such as requiring you to eat, drink, and sleep to survive, and you can only fast travel to your ship. Saving is restricted to being in your ship as well, so if you're out adventuring and die, there's a chance you're going to lose a ton of progress. I started the game on Supernova, and, and I really did enjoy it, but several hours in, I had to dial it back to hard. Because while I liked most of the additions and challenges, the, the fact is, you can only save the game in your ship, and that, that just did not work for me. To play this difficulty, you're going to need dedicated time and no interruptions. With my family and home situation, I just can't be forced to be glued down to the PC for extended periods of time without getting up. So Supernova didn't really work for me. Now, if you have the time and you can play without interruption, though, I think Supernova would be a great experience and some people are really going to enjoy it. I just wish you could play on hard and pick and choose different aspects of the Supernova experience to add to your playthrough. I don't think restricting them to Supernova or nothing was at all necessary. The quests in the game were great for the most part, and aside from a few kill this, fetch that, grab this, or fix that kind of stuff here and there, the rest of the quests felt meaningful and worked to accentuate the main story very well. Some players are going to resent the more rudimentary quests, but I, I promise you it's not overdone here. And personally, I, I don't mind the occasional simple filler quest every now and then. While we're on quests, one gripe I have is that the quest tracker only works with one quest at a time. It's not a huge deal, but I always try to sort of map out some kind of route when I'm heading out into the wild, and having to juggle back and forth from the quest journal to the map repeatedly to get any idea of where my objectives were in relation to where I was currently, like I said, not a big concern, it just could have been better. Aside from the quest tracking, the interface and menus overall were intuitive and easy to navigate. The HUD looked good, and it was effective in delivering necessary information without being too overbearing. I wasn't wowed by any of it, but no real complaints with the interface at all, which is nice. You can rebind any keys you see fit on the PC, which is great, and it, it's really a shame that this day and age I have to mention this as a pro, but so many games get this wrong and force certain keybinds on you, and it's really an unacceptable practice at this point. Now graphically, this game is certainly going to get mixed reviews. The super vibrant, highly saturated environments and models are going to be a love or hate situation a lot of the time. I'm actually surprised they went to this extreme with the world aesthetic, but for me, I love it. I think it looks fantastic and it really goes with the futuristic sci-fi theme. I just remember in the beginning of the game, coming out of that narrow pathway, the world just opens up with all this color and light and really gives you this otherworldly feeling like you just stepped into a f***ing Van Gogh painting or something. I fell in love with it instantly. I just really enjoy the art style they went with here. Sound-wise, everything is solid. I already mentioned the voice acting was top-notch. They really had a great cast of voice actors on board. 
The guns were meaty and bassy enough to satisfy my need to be able to feel the weapons through sound, and they checked all the boxes for me in terms of how a gun should sound in your hands. The growls, screeches, and roars of the native wildlife and monsters are all done pretty well, and they're all believable. Ambient noise, uh, you're not going to get too much here aside from some wind whistling here and there and the occasional howl or something. They definitely could have given the world a more lively atmosphere with some more and better ambient sound effects. If the sound falls short anywhere though, it, it would be here for me. The music is going to be your background noise most of the time and it's, it's done very well. It's never forced or feels like it's too much and the, the selection always seems to go well with what you're currently doing. The battle music that creeps in when fights start also adds an extra bit of intensity in there. Normally, I'm not a big music guy when it comes to video games in general, but when a game does it right, you, you just know. And the, the music, I think, is done right in this game. It's good. You know, I always feel like I'm missing something, and I, I probably am, but that's about the extent of what I'm going to cover because I, I've rambled on long enough here. Now, the game is $60 retail, and it's available with an Xbox Game Pass subscription for the Xbox and PC. Without any sort of hesitation, this game is a buy for me, and an absolute steal if you're a Game Pass subscriber. If you're not interested in anything Game Pass has to offer, and you like to own your games you play, and that's fine, but it is definitely worth the $60, there's no doubt in my mind. Even though Obsidian isn't working with a AAA budget or a big team, the amount and quality of content available here is just phenomenal. And if you're a fan of their past titles, the Fallout series, sci-fi games, or just RPGs in general, you're almost certainly going to enjoy your time with this game. Retail, you're going to pay a premium price, but you're undoubtedly going to receive a premium product. So that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed the review, and hopefully you learned something about the Outer Worlds. If you guys enjoyed the review, do me a favor and hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more content like this. It helps me out a ton, and I really do appreciate it. Also, ring the notification bell to be alerted when a new review is released, and stay up to date and informed. And really make sure your gaming budget is spent on quality games worthy of your hard-earned money. Also, let me know what you thought about the review in the comments, and what you'd like to see me do in the future. Thanks for watching.